Yo, what's going on, E7 fam? Pat here, back with the July 18th balance adjustment preview that was just shown earlier this morning over on Stove. This is the world's patch, so get hype. Uh, mostly for worlds, not so much for the patch. We'll get into that in a minute. But yeah, world's hype, uh, it's coming, man. Uh, much sooner than you probably think. If you're watching this video, the day that it airs, world starts tonight for the global server qualifiers. I'm pretty excited about it. In fact, I'm so excited about it. I'm going to do a watch party, not only for tonight, but pretty much every single night that Worlds is live. So make sure to get subscribed to the channel, ding the notification bells, check out the live tab here on the channel. We will be live later tonight. I will be watching Worlds. We will be commentating on top of all of the activities, giving you my thoughts on everything, how I'm feeling about the tournament as it progresses. You can also check it out over on my Twitch channel at twitch.tv forward slash I am underscore TSU. So yeah, world's hype. Let's go. I'm going to be cheering for global server as I did last year. I really hope that global brings it home this year. What I feel like doesn't bring it home though is uh, this balance patch. I understand that games usually are trying to be relatively safe on their world's patch because they don't want to create a fiasco like say how we had with carrot in year one where we buffed Carrot with a specialty change literally right before World started, uh, and she ruined the entire event. She was literally the, the dominant force of the entire event. The whole entire tournament revolved around Carrot. They're trying not to have that happen again because it's bad for optics, right? But uh, this might be a bit too safe, I feel like, this bounce patch. Because today we're going to be talking about Remnant Violet, Sylvan Sage Vivian, Yuna, Free Spirit Tyria, Mercedes, Camilla, Aether, and then four three-star artifacts. Not even five stars or four-star artifacts in this patch. Just three stars, right? Notably, the girl here, Fallen Cecilia, isn't on it. You know, the face of all of your marketing and your current story that everyone is super engrossed in. And people are asking for a buff because she's like a bottom two, bottom three, Moonlight five-star right now. Nowhere to be seen. Yeah, that's um, that's a choice. I mean, I don't even really think you need to do a ton to fall in Cecilia to bring her in line with current characters without completely breaking the game, right? There's a lot of different suggestions that have been floated out there, like maybe like 30% pen resist for herself or something. Like just something so she doesn't die to like Gala or Janua in one hit, that would help distinguish her as a, a choice for certain tanks, right? Because most of the other options just die in one hit. So if she's the one that you use to counter one specific character, and that's all you gave her, it's fine. Her not being here, kind of disappointing. I, I really think that is a drop ball for sure. Anyways, let's move on now to the actual characters. You guys already know how I do it here. I write down what I think the character is missing, what they would need in order to be better in their defined niche, or if they don't have a niche, I kind of point that out here. So let's start it off. Remnant Violet, the boy, uh, God as some people call him, the face scaling unit. Uh, and Nori's uh, favorite Moonlight 5-star character uh, that's not Lionheart Sermia, whatever you want to call this character. Built-in evasion is by far the most requested thing that this character needs because ever since Conqueror Lilius came out, she would use For Honor, it would strip the evasion buff, and then you'd be like, wow, my Moonlight 5-star doesn't do anything. And then he would just take you know, constant L's. Like, everything was just collateral damage. Like, new character would come out, and it would be designed to counter, you know, something completely different, and it would just affect Remnant Violet. Uh, you know, oh, you know, oh, it's a non-contact strip, and it's designed to, you know, deal with the anti-crit from Navy Captain Landy, and you're just like, actually, it just completely hoses Rylet more and more. So that's, like, the biggest thing. But other than that, I'm unsure. The other two things I have written here are LOL Focus Unit, because... In case you've been living under a rock, Sea Phantom Politis is everywhere. And I know what you might be thinking. Oh, but I pre ban her in RTA. Well, do you play Arena after the Arena revamp? Because, well, Sea Phantom Politis is there, right? Uh, and then you also probably play Guild Wars, I assume, because you want Mystic Metals. Sea Phantom Politis, you're going to interact with her there. So even if you don't play RTA, right? You're still going to interact with C Phantom Politis, and she makes focus and fighting spirit units feel absolutely horrendous to play. So, lol, if you actually are one of those characters. Uh, and then I also have question marks written here because 
built-in evasion is what everybody asked for. Is that enough for this character to see play in 2024? Characters are, you know, insane, right? When I made How to Play Remnant Violet, Massacre was enough to kill most things in the game in one hit. Massacre, despite the fact that it, you know, it has that reputation of killing things in one hit or very close to it in one hit. That still only has like a 1.3x multiplier with 50% defense pen. We're at the point, man, where there's characters whose basic attacks do 100% defense pen, like 25k nuke with splash damage, man. Like Janua and Gala really did a number on what it takes to be a single target DPS in the current state of Epic 7. So... I'm just saying, I don't know what you would do to save this character. So lo and behold, we could just jump into it because it's been sitting on your screen for a bit now. Evasion increases by 50%. So he now has built-in evasion. He doesn't have to worry about the buff. So they gave him exactly what people asked for, right? They gave him exactly what people were asking for here. And then his S1 Sword Flash and his S3 Massacre had their damage dealt increased. And, you know, per usual... In typical Smilegate fashion here, we don't get any multipliers. I don't know how, how much of a damage increase it is. I don't know what it would actually need in order to be good. Looking at what you would get in the past, I'm going to assume Massacre goes from 1.3 to 1.4x. Maybe 1.5x if you're lucky. But I, I don't see it going much higher than that. Uh, you know, famous last words. The last time I said that was Apocalypse Robbie. I didn't think her damage multipliers would get that good. Yeah, <laughs> I, we're not perfect here on this channel. Um, but yeah, it, it just in general, Rylet, I just feel like, I don't know if this is enough. Like, kudos, you know, mission accomplished. We got the thing we set out for, but in a post politis world, in a post Genoa world, I don't know if it's enough. I don't even know if he'll actually get picked at Worlds once this goes live uh, for starting with the third round of uh, Worlds viewings. Sylvan Sage Vivian's up next. Uh, another character alongside of Fallen Cecilia who was on the banner. Everyone was expecting Fallen Cecilia or Sylvan Sage Vivian to either be the, one of the targets for the balance adjustment preview or one of the characters to get the exclusive equipment. Here is Sylvan Sage Vivian, probably like a bottom three ML5. Uh, she basically just has no niche whatsoever. So that's got to be first and foremost. She does basically nothing. Her only real niche was the counter Spectre who isn't in meta anymore. So she does basically nothing else. And that's because she provides like no real team utility outside of like her AOE heal and crit damage buff on the S3. Uh, and even then, like she's not exactly super fast. She's on red Tenebria stat line, which traditionally has insane stats across the board, except for speed, which is just like average. Like it's a good stat line. Don't get me wrong, but you know, it does, the characters that are on it, they, they don't usually have a lot of utility uh, and you don't have the speed to take advantage of it if you actually can. So we need a niche for sure. Also, her damage. Her damage multipliers aren't even like that bad. Like she's got a 1x AoE and a 1.1x AoE, which are average to slightly above average. Those are fine. But the character for somebody who has almost 1400 base attack feels like she hits like a noodle until she stacks up which takes way too long to actually stack up. So that's a, a big thing for her. It's like, she has great attack. She has solid numbers, but she feels like she hits like a noodle. Also, because I said it for Riley, LL focus unit. Like, if you don't change the character's, like, you know, resource management, I can't help you, man. C Phantom Paladus is everywhere. Again, even if you pre-ban her in RTA, you still will interact with her on a daily basis, unless you just choose to not interact with any sort of PvP. And in that case, like, what are you doing? Because you're just giving up a bunch of free Sky Stones, uh, Conquest Points, and Mystic Battles. Like, you're just giving up free stuff that allows you to keep playing the game. So, that's where we're at with the state of Sylvan Sage Trivia. So, first up, Mana Attunement. Increases her attack by 20% when you use it. This is her S1. And the attack increase effect can stack up to three times. And the base damage on mana attunement has increased. Not really too surprising here. Because mana attunement, again, is 1x multiplier. 1.1 or 1.2 is usually what you're expecting to see nowadays. Like 1.2 was back in the day, like two, three years ago. 
was cutting edge, like top of the line. Uh, 1X was considered average with 1.1 being slightly above average. Nowadays, everything's like 1.1. It's like standard, right? So I expect this to be 1.1. I think if it's 1.2, that's kind of insane, especially because now um, nature's judgment attack increase like that you used to get is moved to the S1, right? That could be very, very backbreaking on the character because soul burn on this thing already was pretty decent. If you have three stacks on her, right? And then you soul burn it and the base multiplier is up. Like if it's like 1.1 or 1.2 and you have the 60% attack, like that could just wipe your team, man. For 10 souls, just wipe the team. That's very, very strong. So that is, uh, that's pretty good. I don't know if that gives us a niche though, but that is a pretty strong change to the S1. Next up is on the passive here. Insight at the start of the first battle fully recovers focus. And at the end of the turn gains one focus when focus is three or higher immune to debuffs, right? And then it says when attacked, if expected damage suffers to equivalent to 30%, funny, haha, that it's green text here because it used to be 25%. You would reduce the damage suffered by 70% by expending a focus, right? And after being attacked, decreases skill cooldowns by one turn. That was removed. So we made the damage reduction and the cooldown reduction portion of insight, you know, worse, right? It's just, it's gone. The cooldown reduction doesn't matter as much because nature's judgment, spoiler alert, I mean, you're looking at it. Cooldowns are reduced on it. It goes from six turns to four turns. So you don't have to worry as much. Four turns is just standard S3, what you expect to see in most characters in epic seven at this point but uh we made the damage reduction passive worse by basically making her immune to debuffs if her focus is full that's pretty cool the thing that i need to understand what i need to know smoggy because you don't really explain this right is at the start of the first battle fully recovers focus is it fully or is it five that's a big deal because if it just uh, if you program it to, if you have it say fully recover and you program it to say five, right? Then that means that it's actually two and a half when I fight C Phantom Polydus, which means I don't get this, right? That is kind of bad. So I am trusting when they say fully recovers focus, you get focus even if it is cut in half. And this is before we even talk about the case of whether or not, like, if my opponent has solitary, do I get focus at all, right? Like, I, we're just completely disregarding that. I just think that focus right now is not really in a strong place. So even though this reads really strong, right? Like, oh, you can't get hit by any of the openers or whatnot, right? Like, you can't get sealed by Luna at the start if you've got the, the full focus, right? I'm assuming that's how that works because you would be immune to debuffs. You're at full focus. Um, that seems really strong. Focus, though, as a mechanic, doesn't seem very strong. Also, like your opponent could just love tap uh, your Vivian, make her lose the focus, assuming that you at least meet the, meet the minimum threshold, uh, and then debuff her to high health. So that's also a thing that could happen. <laughs> right? Uh, and then we have here on Nature's Judgment. Damage dealt increases with more enemies, which we'll take that. Having more uh, damage is good. And then amount recover increases proportional to caster's attack. That is still the same. They got rid of the attack scaling uh, passive here. That was moved to mana attunement, which again, I'm pretty happy about that because I usually play Vivian on book because I actually prefer to soul burn mana attunement to save my heal at the start. So I'm okay with that. Losing the critical hit damage buff to all allies for two turns. That kind of sucks. That's some of our utility. Um, overall though, this could be a good change. It could also just do nothing. That's that's kind of where we're at, right? Focus is not in a very good spot. Her stat line doesn't really facilitate the ability to go like super fast. I feel like people are just going to easily play around the focus by just like tapping her and then debuffing her and controlling her. Uh, and then she'll just never really get it back. But uh, she could also still be really good. I mean, this is a character that could essentially 1v1 Dark Corvus pretty handily. That's what people were using her for back in the day. Um, so it's possible.
Like she's never been like a bad unit, but the problem is she's never been like a great unit because she just doesn't have that niche. And I don't really know if she actually got it here. Like being debuff immune and being uh, a really hard hitting AOE DPS that scales well. I need to see the numbers because uh, uh, right now, again, I'm not really seeing it long term. Next up is Yuna. Yuna, uh, we have here. S1 needs to be uncounterable because having an AOE S1 in the current landscape is just suicide. Uh, we need S2 to give an a extra turn because it doesn't. Uh, we need a niche because right now Yuna's played nowhere. Not an ancient inheritance as far as I'm aware of. No PvE content. She's terrible in PvP, right? Genocide very famously used to play her a lot. Gave her up ages ago. Uh, and then also I have written here again, LOL focus unit because it's just not good. Like you are, you could try to have fun with Yuna, but odds are uh, if you're trying to have fun in Guild Warp, cool. You're fighting Sea Phantom Polis. You're trying to have fun in Arena, cool. You're fighting Sea Phantom Polis. Uh, and then there's a, a whole slew of other busted units you have to deal with in World Arena that I just don't think that Yuna can get through, even if they uh, you ban out Sea Phantom Polis. So let's see, what did we get? They, I guess, simplified the S1. It increases the combat readiness of Yuna by 15% when you use it and all other allies by 5% and they increase the base damage. The base damage has always been pretty bad on this thing, so we'll wait and see the multipliers. But as you can see from reading the red text, uh, she got 24% combat readiness in the past when you S1 and the team got 8%. So they made it better if there's less than... Uh, you know, if there's only two or less enemies left, but otherwise, like, you know, the old version was just kind of better, no? Then here on the S2, they gave it an extra turn. Cool. It needed that for sure. That's something that we were asking for. And they increased the attack and speed buff for three turns, which is obviously very welcome. Very strong combination of buffs. She is, I think, one of the few characters that does have that exact combination of speed and attack for the team. I think Inos... Might be the only other one I'm thinking of off the top of my head. And even then, I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, that's a very rare combination. It's very strong. Uh, and then Meteor Cannon. They got rid of a successful attack always results in a critical hit. Why? I don't know why, but they, they just did. Uh, and they moved the extra turn, obviously, to an upgrade. So they don't want to have you be able to chain extra turns repeatedly. So that's why that's no longer here. But this is still not accessible without focus. That's kind of rough. And then they changed the exclusive equipments, which we'll get to. I think this is what they're trying to do with the niche here. So the first one was changed combat race, increased by an additional 1% when hitting homing laser. Now it's 5%, right? I, I believe this works on both halves of it. So her S1 now gives essentially 20% uh, to herself and 10% to the rest of the team, which is not really a lot. Uh, especially because if like Abyssal or Red Polis, Red Polis is very common right now. That gets cut in half. That's not really that huge of a CR push. Uh, and then here on Exclusive Equipment 2, before there was a 30% chance that Upgrade would give Gab instead of Attack for two turns when using Upgrade. That was too low of a chance. Really cool effect, just not consistent. Upgrade is unaffected by cooldown increase and decrease effects. So I think what they are trying to do is get Yuna, because Yuna's exclusive equipment, if you don't know, is speed. She has 112 base speed. So an EE for her basically puts her around the 120 speed range. So she's actually about as fast as uh, C Phantom Paladis if you want to go that route. I think what they're trying to do is have Yuna be a character that can go bef like at the same speed or after somebody like Naqual or somebody like Lua, and then have you press upgrade, get the speed and attack buff for your team uh, to kind of mount a comeback offense. And then you take your extra turn and you press S1 homing laser, you do some damage, and then you push up the rest of the team. The problem is that I don't think the CR push is really that strong. I mean, you get the speed buff, but like we've been playing with Urban Shadow Shoe for a hot minute now. Uh, that's a fast character that gets a speed buff right off the rip. Um, it doesn't allow you to overcome some of the tempo that these really fast teams have, right? It doesn't allow you to overcome C Phantom Politis uh, as an opener. I don't know if it's enough to even let you overcome Nekwal as an opener, if I'm being honest. Because, like, yeah, you can't push back 
this move, but the rest of your team sure as hell can. So that's uh, that's kind of rough. So I understand what they're trying to do. They gave her a niche, right? They gave her an S2, but I just don't think it is enough. Like being a focus unit, being an all AOE unit, these are really big detriments and they gave us nothing to kind of overcome that. So I just don't really see the unit changes panning out, but I do see what they're trying to do here. Next up, we have Free Spirit Tieria, basically the best character for brand new players to Epic 7. And honestly, that's all she really needs. You just want to keep making her a really strong PvE unit for new players and maybe even veterans just expand her PvE usage overall. So I'm just going to very quickly go through this one. They basically increase the damage on the S1, the S2, and the S3. The big ones here being the changes to the S1 and the S3. Those having now damage dealt increases proportional to the target's maximum health. The last time that a three-star got this change was Commander Lorena, and that made her one of the best PvE characters in the entire game. This change, I fully expect, will bring Free, free Spirit Tiaria in line uh, with her. So we might be seeing Free Spirit Tiaria clears for Nightmare Raid. For those of you guys in my chat who always say, I can't do Nightmare Raid, it's too difficult. This is a change that is specifically for you, right? You have a really strong AoE trash mob clearer whose only real drawback in PvE was she wasn't a good boss killer. Now she's a good boss killer with these changes. I expect her to see a lot of PvE usage with this set of changes. Next up is Mercedes, who basically at this point is only really used for Nightmare Raid for one specific fight, as well as some really outdated Guild War defenses. So we kind of need to give her something that helps her expand her usage uh, or expand her niche beyond that uh, other than that make it easier for her to survive give her better survival cases overall because uh, right now again it's outdated because everyone's played against mercedes for a while since she got powered up mercedes form and people know how to deal with it it's pretty easy to kill even though the damage might be impressive um, the consistency at which you could pull it off in 2024 is not really there so let's see what do we get S1, Divine Bolt, damage dealt increased. That's fine. Move already had pretty solid numbers. It's even better now. Dimensional Rupture. They got rid of the whole, I hit you one time with it, and then I get a follow-up attack if I have an attack buff, right? Uh, and then it does like 70% reduced damage or whatever. Now the extra follow-up, the one that you would get off of Magic for Friends, it does the same as the first damage. So it's more punishing to get hit by Dimensional Rupture. I am okay with this change because a common way to combat Mercedes is to bring Green Rowana. And then you would essentially do huge damage off Dimensional Rupture. And then the follow-up attack would just be pitiful amounts of damage. And Rowana would basically heal back most, but not all, of the damage that you took from the first Dimensional Rupture. And that would allow them to stabilize. So if both attacks are the same strength now... Maybe you can actually punch through. Uh, she might be able to punch through that Rowana, and that would give her uh, a bit more use case, uh, especially for those of you who are on defense in Guild Wars. So that could be pretty good. And then finally here, the S3 Blazing Eye of Cal. It has its damage increased. The Soul Burn was removed from the S2, and it was moved to the S3, which extends duration of buffs granted by the skill by one turn. It's a little weak. I think I would rather have kept it where it is. I think that was just them doing it as a precaution because they were afraid that uh, it might be too much damage. Yeah, I, I, I get why we gave extend duration of buffs to Blazing Eye of Cal because obviously you get the attack buff on Blazing Eye of Cal and you want to keep it up as long as possible for Magic for Friends. But traditionally, extend duration of buffs is probably the weakest use of 10 souls for a soul burn. Like if this was like five soul soul burn, maybe, but like at 10 souls now, like this is usually not always, but usually the weakest version of a soul burn. Like almost every character that has ever had this soul burn has eventually gotten it changed at some point. So overall changes are nice, but not really amazing for Mercedes. If I do say so, it will make nightmare uh, a bit be easier though. Next up is Camilla who is a three-star. Traditionally, I say the big change that three-stars need is a specialty change. 
This character needs nothing. She is perfect. She is arguably like a top three to top five PvE character already. She needs absolutely nothing. And so what did they do? They took the skill nullifier off the S2, which people like Tristan and I used in Ancient Inheritance to survive specific sticky situations. So that's gone now in exchange for giving me one extra turn of attack buff, which I don't know if that's worth it. Um, because, again, we're playing this character usually with Benny Mars Tachi. Um, if you don't have Tachi, I guess this is a good change. But we're usually playing this thing with like Tachi so that we don't have to worry about the attack buff that we get from Tactical Maneuver. Like We're using Tactical Maneuver because it's an extra turn skill that gives us some way to take a hit on a 3-star with worse stats. So that's really bad. Uh, and then the other change was just damage dealt increased on the S3, which we're never using anyway. Right? Like, we're using this character for their S1 because their S1 is insane. It's, like, absolutely insane. And they made it so that it's easier for her to die. So that I can't take advantage of the great S1. Like, what, what was this change? It makes no sense. Like, it says right here, Camilla now deals higher sustained damage in battles, right? Skill nullifier has been removed. But, like, but, but why? Like, why? What? What possible reason? Instead, the attack increased effect of greater result out of the highest attack has been extended to three turns, allowing for more consistent high damage output. What do you mean? Everyone plays this character on an artifact that gives you 100% uptime on attack. Like this, this, this is the most baffling change to me in the entire balance patch because it's like, you guys don't watch Tristan, do you? Anybody, you guys who watch my audience who watch Tristan, you know that we just play Tachi, man. Like this is... It, it doesn't ruin the character, right? Like, the character's still usable in PvE, but, like, man, what a misread. What an absolute misread. Aether. Um, I'll be real with you. Specialty change. It's a three-star. Like, I three stars are usually never good, except for, like, characters like Camilla, who are just totally busted, right? Aether needs a specialty change. So, now... They changed his healing multipliers uh, on his healing move. I actually don't even know if it's his S2 or his S3 because I haven't played this character in so long. Um, it now increases proportional to the target's max health as opposed to the max health plus uh, Aether's actual attack. So you don't have to build attack on the character anymore to heal. Uh, I feel like this is a change that should have been made back in like year one of Epic 7. Uh, same here for Spirit's Call, which I'm assuming that is the S3. Yeah, this is also not very good. So unless Aether gets a specialty change, this was basically a waste. I kind of understand why they're doing it, though, because Aether is a character you get for free. Camilla, not so much, but Mercedes is a character you get for free. Free Spirit Sierra is a character you get for free. Yuna, who is also in this patch, a character you get for free. I understand what they're trying to do here. This is the new player balance patch as opposed to the world's balance patch. I mean, I'm all for helping out new players, but some of the changes that we've already talked about, kind of lackluster, uh, if that was your mission statement that you were trying to do, the thing you were trying to accomplish. So finally, let us talk about the three-star artifacts, Mighty Yaksha, Goblin's Lamp, Envoy's Pipe, and Ascending Axe. I'm going to do all of them at the same time because they don't have good stats, so nobody wants to play them because they give you absolute garbage stats. I mean, they're three-star artifacts. They shouldn't really give you great stats to begin with, but... As you may or may not know, unless you've been living under a rock or you're brand new, Daydream Joker is a three-star artifact and is a game-changing artifact, one of the best ones in the entire game. So in order for three stars to actually get some usage, they also need something that is game-changing, maybe something that helps PvE be a bit easier for new players in the same way that Daydream Joker is. So let's see, what do we get? Mighty Yaksha now gives... 20% uh, attack if your health is 50% or higher, as opposed to 10% attack in defense. That's worthless. <laughs> Moving on, Goblin's Lamp. Uh, before, at the start of battle, recovers health of the ally with the lowest health by 20%. So this was like, I guess, decent for players that were playing adventure for the very first time trying to get a foothold. Now, when an enemy is defeated, you have a 100% chance if it's at level 30 to get one soul. One whole soul. But we just established you need 10 for Mercedes Silver and it wasn't worth it. So this is this is literally the worthless meme. Like, you know, whoa. 
this is worthless. Yeah, it's that's this. Uh, Envoy's pipe before damage dealt, uh, damage received uh, is decreased by twenty percent if you have less than fifty percent health. Now it's the damage dealt is reduced by ten percent, just period, which sounds great. But you realize it doesn't stack with things. Almost every knight in the game that you're going to play as a tank offers you something like this or is wearing something like this. And if you're not going to play a knight, Proof of Valor exists and is free for everybody and just completely dunks on this in terms of decreases damage. There is zero reason. Even a free-to-play newer player has better options than Envoy's Pipe with this change. So you have to ask, why... What was it here for? And then we have Ascending Axe. Uh, it used to be increases critical hit chance of the caster by 5 to 10% after making a critical hit. Effect can stack up to three times. So it's like, it helps you bridge if you're missing critical hit chance. Now it just gives 12 critical hit chance. So it gives you basically an imprint's worth of stats. Nope. We already have artifacts, especially in the Thief class, right? And some of the Warrior class ones. They just give a bunch of critical hit chance for free that uh, also gives extra effects like even at like lower rarities right i just why this whole thing why like you're trying to make it i guess better for new players nothing here nothing here is playable in any scenario uh, even the free options that new and free to play players have access to they're all just better this is just bad absolutely uh, straight up fail on all of the artifact changes this is overall a very baffling patch to me because it's filled with, I think, a bunch of nothing changes. And I understand we're trying to play it safe for worlds, but again, it really just does feel like it's filled with almost a bunch of nothing changes. And this is coming off the back of arguably one of the best balance patches of all time. Yes, they went a little overboard, like a little bit overboard with Blood Moon Haste, but that patch was very, very good and very well received. For this to be the the, the sequel, the follow-up, it's bad, man. <laughs> like, uh, it's it's not good. I'm not a huge fan of this balance patch. But yeah, those are just my thoughts. As always, this is the part where I turn it over to you. So let me know how are you feeling about the balance adjustment preview this time. Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and hopefully I'll see you tonight for the Epic 7 WC 2024. Later now.